So, uh, the plan for today is just, just to follow up yesterday's introduction, yesterday's kind of fundamentals to Idris programming. I want to show, I want to start showing some of the interesting things you can start doing once you have dependent types. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, proofs, equality proofs, a little bit about um, different way of doing contracts than we've, uh, than we've seen from, stats, uh, from Sam. Um, so a way of kind of specifying assumptions on data and contracts between data, and a little bit about termination checking. And maybe, maybe if, uh, um, if we've got enough time, we'll talk a little bit about uh, streams and productivity checking. So first thing I want to do, just like yesterday, I got loads of interesting questions written down, so I want to send the notepad around, and we'll do the same thing. Please write down your name, something you got from the lecture, and a question you'd like me to, um, uh, to answer in the next lecture. So I'll just start it here. Um, and some of the things people asked yesterday, I'm going to start with just by, I, I can't answer every question. Uh, what I'll try to do, though, is, is um, I've written them all down. Um, I'll, I'll make a few notes, and I'll put them online somewhere for, for, for most of them. But some of, the, some of the ones that came up most often, I'll go through now. Um, one is, uh, this, this is actually asked quite often in, in other places. So what are the benefits of Idris over Haskell other than getting help from the compiler? Well, firstly, getting help from the compiler is a pretty big deal, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a lot more to it than that. So Haskell um, it, is, is getting all, you know, all these extensions, extension after extension, that's making it closer and closer to Idris. Um, <laughs> maybe. Um, they, they haven't got the uh, swap double and single colons extension yet. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the point being, though, that there are a lot of extensions, and, and it's not really, Haskell's not really one language anymore. It's, it's lots of different languages depending on the extensions you get. And I think it's, it's, it's a good thing to strive for. Simplicity is a good thing to strive for. Everything gets very complicated eventually, so systems always get complicated. And it's good to try to find the essential complexity in the system and see if we can get all of these type system features into something uh, a lot more sort of... Um, well, try, try to condense everything into just one consistent system. So, so that's, that's really the, the benefit of Idris for me, is that you only have the type, uh, the type level language and the term level language, and they are the same language. Whereas in Haskell, uh, you have the two separate languages, and it's almost necessarily so because of the way Haskell has, 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 has evolved. What you get with Haskell over Idris, of course, is a, a massive ecosystem and lots of libraries. So, you know, it's trade-offs everywhere. So, oh, uh, also... Um, one of the benefits of Idris over Haskell is that Idris is strict. <laughs> um, so uh, another question that was asked, uh, is there a standard library? Can I contribute to libraries? So um, it's, there is a GitHub repository. If you go to um, the Idris Lang organization on, um, on GitHub, there's a repository called Idris Dev. Uh, and inside that, there is a prelude. Uh, there is a, there's a couple of packages. So there's a base package that contains lots of useful features, some of which we'll see today. Uh, and the, the place where you would typically contribute to, there's a package called Contrib, which is basically for uh, things that people think might be useful that might eventually become part of the base libraries. Um, and by all means, um, send, send libraries for including in the Contrib libraries. It would be fantastic to have them because you know, we need a bigger ecosystem. We need, if we want people to use Idris for anything a bit bigger, we need more libraries, so um, that's the place to look. Um, have dependent types ever helped you catch a serious bug? This is a fantastic question. Um, and it's, it's, it's a tricky one to answer because um, having dependent types and having this, this idea of type-driven development with types up front, you're not, as long as you have a good model in the type, as long as, as, long as you've figured out what that is, you tend to find that bugs get caught a lot earlier and they tend to be fairly simple things. Like um, a while back, I was doing um, an implementation of a hangman game. So you know, you've, you've got to guess the letters. And you've, you've got a certain number of guesses and a certain number of letters. Um, and I thought, OK, what I'll do is I'll, I'll encode the rules of that in a type. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll be explicit that you lose a guess if you guess wrong. You lose a letter if you guess right. And if you get down to zero letters, you've won. If you get down to zero guesses, you've lost. And um, and I got the guesses and letters the wrong way around when I was implementing it. And of course, it said, you've done it wrong. It's just, you've, 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 you've said that you've won when you've lost. Now, this is not a serious bug, 
I don't think. Um, but the fact that the machine told me that before I even tested it, I thought was pretty cool. So th this kind of thing happens, and you, f you catch these very early. So you're catching the things as early as possible, so you're not really getting the kind of serious and hard to trace bugs. But there's one other interesting thing that happened recently. So um, I was uh, hacking on an implementation of the core type theory of Idris in Idris, because that's the sort of thing I do for fun. And um, I was kind of following the, uh, the, the, the current Idris type checker that's implemented in Haskell, um, just following the rules. And I, I put a few invariants in the types just to, just to make sure I was getting naming right in particular. So getting variable names right in the representation uh, is typically one of the things that goes wrong most often when implementing a language. Um, and I got to a point in the Haskell implementation, copied it into the Idris implementation, and I got a type error. And I thought, oh, that's strange. Does that, mean I've, does, that mean there's, does that mean there's a bug in the Idris type checker implemented in Haskell? And I looked at it for a bit. I peered at it for a few minutes and thought, that's actually wrong. There is <laughs> <laughs> so so, so by, by taking um, uh, the Idris type checker and implementing it again in Idris with a few more invariants, I found a very subtle bug in, in the, the, the um, current Idris type checker that you know, you're all using to do these, uh, uh, these hands-on sessions. Um, and so it was nice to find that, uh, that, that coming up just by adding a little bit more in the types. By the way, it's not a serious bug. It's, it's, if, if, if it trips you up over anything, I'll be astonished. It might possibly cause um, a universe inconsistency in a really obscure situation. So it's, it's not you know, a particularly serious thing, but you know, you, it's, it's nice to be able to find these things. Um, are there rules about names? So we're getting into sort of more low-level questions now. So I, I wasn't explicit about this yesterday. Um, so remember I mentioned that um, if you have a lowercase, uh, 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 a name beginning with a lowercase letter and a type, then that is implicitly bound. So that's, uh, that's the only rule about names that there is. Everything else is convention. So um, I typically begin types with a capital letter because that's what I'm used to from Haskell and because it helps with this convention of, of oh, sorry, it helps with this rule of uh, things beginning with a lowercase letter are always implicitly bound. So as a general rule, it's a good convention to have um, names beginning with a lowercase letter if they are functions or variables and names beginning with an uppercase letter if they're types, but you don't actually have to do that. Uh, yeah? Does that mean you have the So it, it's the same rule for patterns, uh, that if it begins with a lowercase letter, then it's, uh, then it's, oh. then it's, then it's implicitly banned. So, so this whole thing about implicit binding of names goes for patterns and types in just the same way. Yeah. What's the most important feature missing from Idris? I think a good runtime system. Um, so so we've, got a, we've got a C back end, which works. But um, sometimes it's embarrassingly slow. It doesn't have a good garbage collector, for example. So if you're doing a lot of allocation, typically find that, that when you profile programs, that it's spending, I don't know, 80% of its time garbage collecting, which is kind of embarrassing. Uh, the reason it does that is um, the technology uh, that's implemented for the garbage collector was invented in 1971, so a Chinese algorithm, which is really cool. But there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of work done on garbage collection since then. Um, so ideally, you know, if someone feels like coming along and, and implementing an LLVM backend, that would be fantastic. So, you know, um, another, another challenge for somebody. If, and, and I think there would, there would be, there would be some, a lot of research potential in doing that. So, so there'd be a lot of interesting things you might find out by doing that. Yeah, so another question. So, um, if the language is so similar to Haskell, and the, the, the type system um, basically gets erased when you generate code, can you not just generate Haskell? Um, so I don't think the word just belongs in that sentence. <laughs> um, but you, there, there are, you could do that. Um, but it's kind of sad that it would be sad to me that, that we've got all of this extra stuff in the types that maybe says that um, you, know, you don't need to do a, a dynamic check here because you've already done a dynamic check somewhere else. And you'd lose that if you go to the Haskell backend. So yes, I think you'd get some really good performance that way. And, and I think it's probably worth doing just as a, maybe a weekend hack sometime to, to, to generate Haskell code. We'd probably get pretty good performance. But I would find that a little bit unsatisfying because I think we can go a lot further. Also, it makes, the, uh, it makes the system more complicated than it needs to be. And I think having our own back end, our own like, nice small back end targeting LLVM would be a, a lovely thing to have. Um, so are there plans to implement Idris in Idris? Uh, <laughs> 
So uh, people often ask this, and I think you know, self-hosting a compiler, what, what, are the, what are the benefits of self-hosting a compiler? Well, it certainly shows that your compiler is good enough to self-host. That's, that's kind, of, kind of a useful thing to do. Also, it means you, you have to do all the things you need to do to make a meaningfully sized system in your language. So it is worth it from that point of view. So you need to have things like parsers. Yeah, you, you need good data structure libraries. So it's certainly worth doing. Also, it would be worth, um, I mean, there are, you know, if you look at the, uh, the, the issue tracker for Idris, there are a few things that, that are fairly, you know, they're, they're basically design mistakes that are quite deep problems, quite hard to fix. And a lot of them, it would be worth just taking this type-driven development approach to writing Idris itself and seeing if we can truly get the benefits of, of, of the type system in implementing Idris and see if these deeper problems go away. Uh, so that's a long way of saying, no, there are no plans, but it might happen. You never know just by accident. Because you know, if, if I have crazy hobbies like implementing the core type theory of Idris in Idris, who knows what's going to happen? But there's no concrete plans to do it, even if it would be a good idea. Um, anything fundamental about dependently typed languages that make it slower at runtime? Nothing fundamental, but you do have to do a bit of work to... Uh, sometimes you have things that appear in types that... Um, don't actually need to be there at runtime, but somehow still manage to creep into the program. So you might have, um, we'll, see, we'll maybe see some more examples of this uh, today, that um, might have some predicate on a value that, that is needed to show that another value has a particular form. And so you kind of have two bits of the program that are, that are computationally fulfilling the same role, uh, but you only need one of them. So, so you need to do a bit of work to erase unnecessary uh, data but once you've done that, you're essentially down to untyped lambda calculus, and you can use all the same techniques that, uh, that have been known for and developed for a long time. So nothing fundamental, but you do need to do a little bit of, uh, a little bit of additional work um, to get it working. Uh, now we're on to the slightly silly questions. Why do you have a PHP backend? Uh, would you believe it was for a bet? <laughs> um, I was at a, a conference a couple of years ago, and uh, someone said to, do you know Thomas Petrasek, uh, uh, the F-sharp hacker? Someone said to him, if you stand up and say, I love PHP, I will buy you a pint. And he refused to do that. And I just casually said, well, I have been thinking about hacking out a PHP backend for Idris. And instantly, people just handed me beer tokens. That were <laughs> <laughs> so, right, I have to do it now. Um, also, it's kind of fun. It's, 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 kind of, it's kind of cool to be able to do this sort of thing. And, and it's like 150 lines of Haskell to do the PHP backend. It's, it's, it's really quite pleasing that it's that small. And it has served a really useful purpose, believe it or not, which is that people are interested in doing code generators for uh, different systems, particularly Java, JVM, uh, or .NET. Um, and someone even wrote um, dash dash code gen Java rocks. I can do Idris at work now. Um, and the people who do this, they look at the PHP backend as a starting point because it's small and comprehensible. So, so it has, against all reasonable expectations, been quite a valuable thing to have. Uh, so the last question I'll do is, uh, this came up a few times, can I have a book? Um, well, let's find out. So, so what I'm going to do is sort of shuffle these around a bit. I need someone to pick a random number. Does anyone have a cryptographically secure random number generator? Or even, sorry. <laughs> zero. That doesn't help me. I can't count down as far as zero. Uh, there's about, I don't, there must be about 50. But, uh, I, I don't think you're equally likely to select something once you pick something that is Well, I'm, 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 I'm sort of, I'm just casually shuffling them here. You, you, give me, you give me a number between one and about 20, and I'll count down from the top. Okay. And then I'll stop shuffling when you give me the number. Ten. Ten. Right, hang on. Start from there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This one, can I read the name? Marcus Clinic. Where's Marcus Clinic? <laughs> so you win, you win an Idris sticker, but it's got a special secret code on the back Ooh. that gets you an ebook. Right, okay. Um, what was that? Sorry? What was oh, what was his question? Um, are you happy for me to read out your question? Yes, please. Um, oh, can dependent types ever help you catch a nasty bug? That was one of the ones I wrote down. And uh, <laughs> yeah, very good question. 
Um, right, okay, so that's, uh, yeah, let's get, let, let's get on with today's stuff. So hopefully, so, so there, are, there are quite a lot of other good questions, which, and, and a lot of them I think the answers are going to come up as we go, so particularly questions about implicit arguments were coming up, um, so, so we'll see a bit more of that. A little bit about proofs was coming up, we'll see a bit more of that. Okay, so type-driven development, here's, a, here's, a, here's an analogy for type-driven development. So this is, um, this is a photo from... Um, my new favorite pub in Durham City in the north of England. Uh, it has a communal jigsaw, as, as all good pubs should have. And it's right next to the station. So, so basically, that's where you meet people off the train. And if they're not there yet, you start doing the jigsaw. Um, so you've got a specification. So here's the, here's the specification. Here's the partial implementation. So satisfying that specification. And um, so you've got, this is like, your types, these are your holes, we're filling in the holes according to that specification. You, as you start making progress, so here um, we've got, um, uh, so this is site, well, yeah, you, you, this is, you can see the train. So you can see the interesting part of the picture is, is, has appeared now. So it's like when you're writing a program, what happens? You, you sort of code the happy path of the program. You, um, you say, right, well, if no, one, if no one makes any mistakes, or if, if this case doesn't happen, then the program works. Fine, we're finished now. So here, this jigsaw's finished because we've done the interesting bit of the jigsaw. We can now see the picture of the train, and that's lovely. Well, not really. That, that's it's 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 sort of it's now a partial. It's, it's it's a partially completed jigsaw. There is there is more to do here, even though we can see the nice interesting bit. So when we're writing programs, we really need to think about not only the happy path, not only the interesting bit of the program, but what could possibly go wrong, and. I think it would be nice if um, our languages could tell us more about what could possibly go wrong. So there, there are um, so flags in Haskell and tools for, for Haskell and other languages too that, uh, that will tell you if you're missing cases in pattern matches and maybe they're, they're quite sophisticated analyses to do some control flow analysis to see if there's um, uh, anything particular you've missed. But if you have um, a more precise type system, you can, uh, you can get a lot of that information just by type checking. So you remember zip yesterday, we looked at zip. And in zip, the type checker, or the, the, the interactive editing, it only gave us, when we matched on the first thing being empty, it only gave us the empty list for the second case. So we didn't even have to provide a non-empty list for the second case, because we knew that it had to be empty. So when you have, um, when you have a bit more in your types, you can start ruling out these cases by type checking, and the machine will know that the other cases are not possible. There's another bit of uh, type-driven development. So this is the, uh, I'm just giving you a tour of Scotland now. So um, this, is, this is the Queen's Ferry Crossing. This is um, a new crossing over the Forth, just north of Edinburgh. So you've got the Forth Bridge, um, which was the original one. So that's the, the, the railway crossing. It's called the Forth Bridge, not the Forth Rail Bridge, pub quiz fans. And then there's the Forth Road Bridge, um, which is ready to fall over because it's, it's well past its lifespan. So this is a new road bridge that they're building uh, at the moment. It's actually got a bit further now. They've, they're doing hole-driven development. You can, see them, you can see them filling in the last hole here. They're just lifting up uh, a new bit of road to fill that in. So again, they've satisfied the specification, but there's a hole in it. So um, this is not really a happy path. But um, it's, it's just to say that you can't have a partially complete specification and say that you've finished. But we do that in programming all the time. And um, I guess if you're going to have a development methodology, the tired old analogy with bridge building has to come up at some point. So here it is. Right. So what is a total function? I'll be talking about um, you know, happy paths, part partially written programs, things missing. So what do I mean by total functional programming? So a total function is a function which, for all inputs, for all well-typed inputs, it's either going to terminate with a well-typed result, or it's going to produce a finite and non-empty prefix of a well-typed infinite result in finite time. So think streams. You might be generating an infinite number of, number of things, but we only need the first portion of that stream. Or think um, servers. So a server is a program that will um, carry on consuming requests from a user and producing results, uh, producing responses to those requests, but it will only consume as many as we're interested in uh, while the server's running. So it might be something that's running forever, but we'll consume bits as we go. So it's producing a well-typed uh, prefix. In the case of a server, that's producing uh, a response to a request as, as we need it. So this is what I mean in general by total programs. I know 
in advance that I'm going to get a portion of the result when I run this program. So I think if we really care about types, we should also care about totality. So um, I'm not going to say too much, or I'm not, not going to go into the philosophy of you know, how we check for totality. And you know, thanks, to, thanks to Alan Turing, we know that we can never write a system that will always decide successfully whether a program terminates or not, whether a program is total or not. But we can you know, come up with a few heuristics. So I'm not going to go into that too much here. Just to say that it is, um, if we know that a program is total, there's a lot more we can say about it. There's a lot stronger claims we can make about it. So um, if you have some term t, uh, lowercase t, oh, sorry, I called it f. If you have some term f of type big T, if f is total, we can say something quite strong about it. We can say that it will always give a result of type t in some finite time. I mean, that finite time might be very big, but at least it's finite. If it's partial, we can't quite make such a strong claim. We can say that if it ever gives a result, then that result will be of type t. It might crash, it might, infinite, it might go into an infinite loop, um, but if it does give us a result, it'll be a result of type t. Uh, so t, what, is, what, is, what am I using t as an abbreviation for here? Um, so it could be, you know, to reasonably it could be an abbreviation for type, but um, could also reasonably be an abbreviation for theorem. So um, if you think of the type as being a proposition, so we talked about Curry-Howard, propositions of types, um, then that type is some theorem, and the program is a proof of that theorem. Uh, and you wouldn't be very happy with a proof of a theorem that, um, that, that, that where, where someone said, well, x is true because x is true. And that would be like a recursive program, an infinite loop that's, uh, that's trying to prove your theorem. That would, be, that would be a strange thing to have. It'd be like, I don't know, some kind of meaningless phrase like um, Brexit means Brexit or something like that. <laughs> uh, um, so... <laughs> So we don't want to do that. Um, so if you're, if you're thinking about proofs, if, if you want, if you want to uh, state things about your program and consider them, truly consider them proofs, they really need to be total. And, and uh, whether, whether that totality, whether the totality of that program is checked by a machine or, or there is some external argument about it, you at least need some kind of justification that it's, uh, that it's total. So this is why the... So I, I talk about... Um, programs being total doesn't necessarily tell you about how long they're going to run. So this is sometimes a, an argument people make about why it's not really that important to think about totality checking. I think when, you, when you're looking at uh, proofs, when, you think, when you're making statements about programs, the programs that you want to be total are actually the ones that you're never going to run. So, so these things might take a really long time, given some inputs, to compute the proof object. But it doesn't matter. You're never going to run it. You know, you know that it's going to produce the right answer eventually, so you don't bother running it. So, what, that's, so if, if, something is, if, if a program is kind of being a proof, that's fine. If it's, if it's a program that you're going to run, maybe it's less fine. OK, so just to say a little bit about how Idris checks for totality, and then we'll go on to a few, uh, a few examples of, of proofs and so on. So, so it's looking for, um, firstly, coverage. So we saw this yesterday with zip. Check whether the patterns you have uh, cover all the possible well-typed parts. So ruling out the ones that aren't typed, uh, making sure that all the ones that are well-typed are still covered. Uh, also looking for termination. So termination would be that there is um, an argument which decreases to some base case um, no matter what the inputs are. So, so there's a, a principle called the, the size change principle for program termination. So it's a very nice paper from Popple 2001, uh, which is basically what's implemented in IDRIS. It's looking for decreasing paths through the, the, through the program. Alternatively, uh, uh, productivity. So productivity is um, making sure that a program always produces some prefix of a result. So whether we look for termination or productivity depends to a certain extent on the data types we're using. We'll see a little bit more about that. But these are, these are the ways Idris uh, looks at programs to decide whether it considers them total. Right, so uh, let's, uh, let's look at a few examples. Let's, let's get to the hacking. So I'll start with some proofs. And remember, these are, we're now thinking about proofs of properties of values in a program. So here, it's, it's, it's important that these things end up being uh, total. So Idris does, um, by default, it doesn't report an error 
if, um, if, a, if a function isn't total. It, 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 it's quite happy to let you do that, but it always checks. Um, and uh, you, can, you can add flags to say, I need this to be total, or we can add a flag at the top of the file that changes that default and says, OK, it's now important in this file that everything is, is total and report an error if it's not. So I'll add that flag here. Now, first thing I'm going to do is uh, probably the smallest, uh, the smallest property that, uh, that we might care about a program is showing that two numbers are definitely equal. So this, this data type, so we've seen data types of this form where we've got a type constructor that um, it builds the type from some values. So we saw this with vectors yesterday, where the, the length of the vector was appearing in the type. Here, we're, we're, we're trying to show that two natural numbers are equal. So we have the two natural numbers appearing in the type. So we can talk about, you know, is, is 4 equal to 5, for example. We could write the type 4 equals 5. We're not going to be able to, well, hopefully, if we get this right, we're not going to be able to produce a value of type 4 equals 5, but at least we can write it in the type. And then this data constructor says, given some number, that number is equal to itself. So we can only construct um, a value in this data type if the numbers we're talking about really are equal. So I, I, there's no way I could write something of type, you know, I could, no way I could use same nat to make something of type uh, eknat45, um, but there is a way I could use same nat to make something of type eknat44. So we use that to do uh, a small proof. We're going to prove that 2 plus 2 equals 4. So this, this type here basically says, as a, as a proposition, 2 plus 2 equals 4. And we're going to write a program which is a proof object that verifies to the machine that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Um, so how do we do that? Um, well, the only thing we have available is same nat. And um, the number, well, the number that we're, pr oh, actually, let's, let's, let's not do it that way. Um, if, I, if I check the type of the hole here, we'll see something slightly interesting. I think it's slightly interesting. We'll see that rather than trying to show that um, 2 plus 2 equals 4, we'll see that what Idris wants us to do is show that 4 equals 4. So the way, the way type checking works, sort of conceptually, you can think of this just conceptually, is that um, the type checker will reduce any expression it sees to normal form. So if it sees 2 plus 2, it will reduce that to 4. And if it ever is checking whether two things are the same type, essentially what it does is it reduces them both to normal form and sees if they're equal. That's not quite what it does in practice, because that, be, that would be a bit slow if that was what we were really doing. But conceptually, that's just what you need to think about. So that means that the type we see here is not eknat 2 plus 2, 4, but eknat 4, 4. So what do we have to make a proof that 4 equals 4? We've got same nat. We'll give it 4, and then we're done. So there we go. And uh, it loaded successfully, so, so it's fine. And this, this has to be total because we've said it has to be total. So we could try doing something like, just to show what goes wrong, um, let's see if we can prove that 2 plus 2 equals 5. Oop. Um, let's call it that. So if I try the same thing, um, so I'm trying to show that 4 equals 5. And if I, well, I don't know what number I put here, but let's put 4. Um, and it says, no, you can't have that because, um, okay, maybe you can't read this, but it says type mismatch between eknat num num and eknat 4 5. So it, it, it can't resolve num to both 4 and 5. I could actually prove this by, you know, going into the infinite loop. And, and that would... Uh, just beta uh, equivalent, but um, that's something that we should do something about. Um. Oh, that's interesting. It said file loaded successfully. That's slightly worrying. <laughs> um. Oh, that's reassuring. It was. Uh, that's, I think that's. A, I think that's an issue with the atom mode, actually. That, that it, uh, it, it it ignores the totality checking. <laughs> Largely because if you're doing interactive editing, sometimes while you're writing a program, you're going through a state where the program is partial, um, and eventually you end up with a total program. So that's something that needs resolving. So if you, but if you load it into the REPL, it says uh, small proof not equal is possibly not total due to the recursive path. It says possibly because it's sort of hedging its bets a bit, because it, it's, it's read about Alan Turing and the halting problem. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that, that gets past the type checker, but it doesn't get past the totality checker. 
So once you have, um, once you have proofs of things, you can start uh, doing slightly more interesting reasoning. So let's say we have a proof that x equals y. We might want to make a proof that x plus 1 equals y plus 1. So that, that equality respects adding a successor. So let, let's try to do that proof. So remember when you're doing proofs, they really are um, just functions. Um, go on, wake up. Right, um, I don't know what happened there. Um, okay, so when, when, you're write, when, when you're doing proofs, you are just writing functions from whatever the input is to the, whatever the output is. So just like when we were writing functions yesterday, we make the candidate definition, we do pattern matching on, uh, on the inputs uh, as appropriate, and see, uh, and, and see what we need to do next. So look, if you look at successor RHS type now, we'll see that, well, x1 is of type equal to xy, just as we expect. But if I pattern match on, on x, We'll, we'll, we'll refine, well, we'll, we'll, we'll learn a bit more about what x is. So, so if we do pattern matching on x, we'll only get the one possibility that it's same nat and some number. And if it's same nat and some number, that means we know a little bit more than we did before. We know that this must be a proof the two numbers are equal. The only way we can construct something of type eq nat x, y is if x really is equal to y. So what it's done is it's said, well, they, bo they both must be x. Therefore, the thing you're trying to prove now is not that successor of x is equal to successor of y, but that successor of x is equal to successor of x. And that's quite easy to do. It's a uh, same net of successor of x. So there we are. That's, uh, that's how you do proofs. You do proofs by writing programs that manipulate things which represent um, information about, uh, about your program. Now, it would be really boring if we had to define one of these data types for every possible thing that, 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 that we care about. So, so there, is a, there is an equality type in the library, uh, so defined just like this. So um, we can say that any value of type A and any value of type B might be equal. Oh, is there a question? Sorry, yes. Is it? Uh, successor, it, it is because, um, well, okay, because there's a bug in Atom, the, the Atom editor, but uh, um, it is total, yes, so, because it didn't complain. I, I can even ask, so it's worth, it's sometimes worth checking at the, um, at the REPL, um, uh, so you can ask at the REPL, is this total, and it will say, yes, yes, it is total. Which one? What's, what's the uh, concern? But if x, if x isn't equal to y, I can't even provide this thing an input. So I will never be able to provide an input to this function where x isn't equal to y because there is, uh, I'm sorry, I will never be able to provide a canonical imp input to this function at runtime that x is not equal to y because the only way of making something of type uh, equal to xy is if x and y really are the same thing. So, um, Therefore, it's total because there's only, it's, remember the definition of total? All well-typed inputs. So your 4 equals 5, your, 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 your same net of, 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 um, that, that produces you a 4 equals 5, not a well-typed input. Um, okay, so um, we've got, uh, we've got a, a generic equality type that does essentially the same thing, but for any possible types. And slightly more interestingly, rather than, rather than just being the any value of type a could equal any value of type A. We, 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 can, we can propose equalities between value of type A and a value of type B. So I can write, you know, zero equals true as a type, or, you know, some string hello world equals 42 as a type. I will never be able to produce a proof of that, but I can at least propose equalities between different types. This turns out to be quite useful when you're, um, when you're working with dependent data types, where, you don't, you, the, where the indices of that data type might be equal, but not necessarily. So just to do the same thing, proving that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Um, uh, well, two, I, I'm, I'm actually trying to show that 4 equals 4. And I'll just do a search for this one. Um, so 2 plus 2 equals 4 is, is the proof of that is REFL. So um, that's equality proofs. Uh, yeah, question.
Uh, because I, I made the number an explicit argument of same nets, but the x is not an explicit argument of, of REFL. So I could make this implicit, because it's a lowercase name in the type, so that's fine, and then just get rid of all of these, um, and that would, be, that would be fine. So it's just about, uh, uh, I, I, I use an explicit, uh, an explicit argument just because you can then see exactly what's going on, but it doesn't have to be an explicit argument. Uh, right, so um, equality proofs, we'll, we'll see them in action in a moment, but before, before we see them in action, I want to show inequality proofs. So we also have um, an empty type. So void is a type with no values. If you ever have, if, if a value of type void ever shows up at runtime, something has gone wrong. Um, and it should be, at least in theory, if the, lang if, if the implementation is correct and the language is sound, it should be that if you have a value of type void and the machine thinks it's total, then you have a bug. Um, it is actually possible to produce values of ty total, write total functions to produce a value of type void uh, in Idris at the moment, but it's really, really hard to trip the appropriate bugs to do that. Um, I'm not going to say issue that as a challenge. It's very, very hard to do it by accident, um, I think. <laughs> But um, anyway, uh, so the idea of um, producing something, you, I mean, how, do you, how do you produce something? How do you write a function that produces something of the, of the empty type? Well, this, this, um, this function not true says that if I happen to have in my hands a proof that 4 equals 5, then something weird has happened. Therefore, I, should be able, I, I can use that to produce a value of the empty type. So 2 plus 2 equals 5 should be an uninhabited type. And if I have an uninhabited type, I can make another uninhabited type. Now, I'll never be able to get one of these at runtime um, if I do something that's gone badly wrong. And, and this is simply to say that, that you know, it's, 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 it's an impossibility to have, to, to, to have something of type 2 plus 2 equals 5. So how do we do that? So what I'm going to do, as usual, is I'm going to make a candidate definition. It's a function, so you know, this, is the, this is the input type to the function, 2 plus 2 equals 5. This is the output type. So um, I'll try pattern matching on this proof, 2 plus 2 equals 5. So we, we could look at this, if we look at this um, type of this hole, it says, well, proof is of type 4 equals 5. And if you look at the data type, the equality data type, we'll see that this one constructor, we can... Um, so, so it, it has type x equals x, which does not fit this form, 4 equals 5. So what happens if we try pattern matching on this proof? Um, the, the, the thing we get, so REFL is not, it's not a well-typed input to this function. So it can't be a well-typed input because it would have type 4 equals 4 or 5 equals 5. So let's just see what happens if we try pattern matching on that in, in Atom. It says this is impossible. So this impossible keyword, so we haven't seen this yet, this, this impossible keyword means that the case that we've talked about here can never happen. And the, the rules it follows for can never happen is essentially what it does is type checks this expression. If it sees uh, a, a unification error with conflicting constructors of the same data type, so in this case it would be zero is conflicting with successor, so it's, it's trying to make zero and successor the same. That is never going to succeed. There is no way of solving that unification problem. And th so that's what impossible means. This, is, this, this, this left-hand side is, is not going to type check. So um, if I load that again and check whether not true is total, then it says it's total. If I try running not true, well, you know, good luck with that. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to find something that is of type 2 plus 2 equals 5, and the only thing I have available is REFL, and that's not going to work. So there you go. Um, yeah, question? Is it an error if you give a right-hand side? Uh, yeah, so let's see what happens if you do. Um, um, so so if, I, if I try giving, um, if, 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 if I you know, try writing the left-hand side and, 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 and saying, well, well, I'm going to see if I can do this, then the left-hand side doesn't type check, so because there's a type mismatch between four and five, because we're trying to show four equals five. Uh, yeah. Um, it's fair to say that not true is total just because the domain is empty. 
Right. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by, I mean, you, you, you can never provide any well-typed input to this. Um, so we're sort of speculating what would happen if we did provide something of type 2 plus 2 equals 5, and then this function says you can't. So, um, so um, I'd, I'd like to move on just to show how this works in practice, because I, I think this is, this is probably the most mystifying thing about a dependently typed programming language. People may disagree with this, but I think in practice, this is the most mystifying thing that you'll come across. But it's absolutely crucial when you start um, uh, talking about more interesting properties of programs. And these things do come up in practice. Once you've started using them, once you've seen them come up in practice, it becomes a lot clearer. So most, thing, most things I find in practice become clearer when you start actually using them. And then you go back to the definitions and say, OK, that's, I see what's going on there. So let's, let's try using them in practice and, 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 see, and, and, and see what happens. So there was a question yesterday about, um, so I showed printf, and there was a question about what happens if the input turns up at runtime and that input is not right. So there's something wrong with that input. We also saw a zip. So zipping together two lists, and I, I showed the assumption in the, the, the zip function that the two inputs are the same length. Now, let's imagine that, uh, that we've been contracted to produce a, an exciting new application that, that sticks two lists together, given user input. Um, so, you know, um, the user will type in one list, then they'll type in another list, and then we'll assume that they're the same length and stick them together. Well, users aren't noted for their ability to uh, write input correctly every time. So we can't make that assumption that the two lists are the same length. We're going to have to, before we call the zip function and ship the result back to our, our um, you know, high-paying customer, before we write that, we're going to have to check that, that, that the, the values, of the, the length of the list are the same, and we're going to have to convince the type checker that we've done that. So let's try doing that. So the function we're going to write instead is called tryzip. Takes a vector of length n, uh, takes a vector of a different length, m, and it will maybe, if it succeeds, produce a, a vector of length n that zipped, uh, that, that's put, taken everything from the second vector and, and zipped it onto the first vector and, uh, and uh, attached it to the first vector. So there's, the only way we're going to be able to produce this result um, successfully is if m really is equal to n. That's uh, uh, the point here. So, well, there are other ways, I suppose, but they're quite tortuous. But that's, uh, the, the only simple way of doing that is if n and m are the same length. So um, a natural thing to, to want to, to try to do is um, just check, just, just test whether n equals n. That's what you would do in, in, a, in a simply typed programming language. If we want to use n and m, so um, remember implicit arguments. So these, these, these arguments here, n, m, a, and b, they are all um, legitimate arguments to this function. We've just, we've just left them implicit. So if I, if I check the type of this hole, we'll see that um, you know, we do have n and m there. Um, they're not in scope for, for us. They're not usable by us at the moment, but they are legitimate arguments to the function. We can bring them into scope by putting them in um, curly braces. So this is just to say that these, I know that these are implicit arguments. I now, I'm now wanting to use them, so, um, so I'll do that. There are two questions. I wonder if they're the same question. Uh, by the name? <laughs> by, uh, so it's called n here, so it's got to be called n here. So I could, I could give it a different name like this. Um, did you have a similar question? I was wondering why there are the um, Because um, as soon as I pattern match on x's, x's so let's say x's is the empty list, n doesn't exist anymore because it's 0. Um, I have actually tried to implement it so that, uh, so that n is in scope by default. And, and if, uh, if you pattern match on x, n equals 0. But all kinds of weird things go wrong if you try to do that. And I haven't made it work. So, um, so may maybe, maybe I could make it work later, but it doesn't work at the moment. Now, what we'd like to do is say, if n equals m, then, uh, then um, zip x as y's, else, oh, I need a just, don't I? Uh, then just zip x as y's. So we'd like that to work, yeah? That, that, that's the sort of thing that you think might be reasonable? 
So we could try it. And it says, no, I'm not having that. Because it still thinks, in, in, this, in this section here, where we're trying to use zip, so I'll, I'll, um, um, I'll replace that with a hole, so it, it, work, it works up to this point. By the way, here's a handy tip. Uh, if you get a type error and you're not quite sure what's going wrong, take the expression that, um, that, that, that didn't work, replace it with a hole, and then you see what type you're expecting there. So, so it's, uh, um, yeah, that did type check. So let's just check the type of this, this help, and we'll, we'll see what we have. And even though we've checked that n equals m, it still thinks that y has type vect mb. So why might that be? Um, is this an answer or a question? OK, go on. Right, yeah, that's exactly it. So if you look at the type of equality, uh, I haven't explained interfaces yet, by the way. So for the benefit of people who don't know Haskell, um, this, is, um, this is a generic type. So tie is a type variable. So this, is a e this means that um, the equals operator will compare any two things for equality, provided that we've implemented this interface for that type. So that's, that's, that's all that's going on there. So yeah, that's th exactly the problem. It returns bool, and that bool could be... I mean, maybe, maybe for some reason, maybe we've implemented uh, equality on NAT so that it returns inequality. Or maybe it always returns true. Or whatever. So this, there's nothing in the type here that says what's going on. So the machine just has to assume nothing about, uh, about what's happened to M. So we're going to need to do something a little bit cleverer. We're going to need to not check for equality and return a Boolean, but check for equality and, if they're equal, actually return a proof that they're equal. If there's a proof that they're equal, we can start doing something useful. And if, but, uh, uh, so we can start reasoning about it and, and actually change that N, uh, M to an N. If we don't have a proof, we can't do that. So um, how might we do this? Well, we've just seen equality proof. So I'm going to write a function which, given two numbers, N and M, oh, I'm, I, I shouldn't use the syntactic sugar, uh, really. Let's do it that way. Um, so this, this function might produce a proof that n equals m. And uh, this is where it starts to get important that you know, these, these things are total, because you know, we don't want it to just produce any old thing. We just want it to produce any old proof. It needs to be an actual proof that n equals m. And we'll just go through that by pattern matching, pattern matching on n and m. So um, uh, I'll, I'll just generate all the cases. So I'm not expecting you to follow along with this, because I'm going to go a little bit quickly. Um, Actually, I'll tell you what I'll do. In instead of that, I'll, uh, uh, be before I write that function, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to use it. So um, uh, how would we use it? So instead of, instead of uh, using if then else to check whether n equals m, we're going to use check eek nat, eek nat to maybe produce a proof that m equals m. So um, there's a keyboard shortcut I'm going to use here, control alt m. m is for match. Uh, it actually generates a case, but uh, I'd already used c. So I can generate a case expression to, um, uh, to match on an intermediate result. Basically added that because I'll do anything to avoid typing if I don't need to. Um, so check eknat nm. And this is either going to return nothing, in which case there's no proof, or just, and then a proof that n equals m. So uh, I'll case split on that. Uh, if it doesn't produce um, a proof, there's nothing more I can do. So if it doesn't produce a proof, the result is uh, nothing. If it does produce a proof, well, let's, let's look at the type now. Of, so this is where we had the then branch before, and it went wrong, because we, didn't have, uh, any, we, we couldn't say anything about n and m. So if we look now, we'll see that we have, we have vect n a and we have vect m b, but we have this additional thing, the proof that n equals m. Um, so given that we have that proof that n equals m, we can do something useful with it. So before, when we did that um, same eknat function, where we matched on the proof, and that told the type checker more about uh, the two values that we had. Similarly, we can do a match on this x, um, which can only be REFL. If it's been produced, it can only be REFL. And if we look at the type of the whole now, we see we have exactly what we need. So it's, it's, because it's REFL, the only value that m could have is n. Therefore, it's replaced it with n. Therefore, we can now do the thing we wanted to do. OK? so. Does that type check? That type checks. Um, so we're going to we're gonna have to implement check eek nat um, to be able to run this thing. Um, I mean, I'll show you what happens if we don't. 
try zip one, two, three, six. Right, it says, um, so it, it gets as far as case, whatever the result is. So um, if, if we get the right result, we'll be able to do more stuff. So you can evaluate things with holes in, but if, if, it, if the evaluator reaches a hole, it'll get stuck and it will show you what, where it's got stuck. So we need to finish this, uh, this definition before we can, we can actually try out this function. Um, so you write this pretty much the same way you would write uh, an ordinary equality test that's producing a Boolean, except that you produce the proof uh, as, rather than producing true. Uh, so 0 equals 0, they are equal. So it's just and then um, a proof. 0 doesn't equal successor of anything, so that's nothing. Successor of something doesn't equal 0, so that's nothing. And successor of k equals successor of j if um, k equals j. Now remember to, to produce a proof that these two things are equal, successor of k equals successor of j, we're going to need to begin by having a proof that k equals j. So we're going to use check ignat recursively. Check ignat uh, k j. If they're equal, then, well, if they're not equal, then we've lost. Uh, if they are equal, um, then we've won. OK? Uh, question, yes? Let's just test that. Did I just miss a case? Or did I just forget to save it? I just forgot to save it. Uh, yeah, that was a question. Instead of the case, why can't you just put check it not KJ? Um, because the proof I need here, so check it now produces a proof that k equals j. And I need a proof that successor of k equals successor of j. So what I could do instead, instead of using the, the case here, or in, in, yeah, instead of uh, matching on this explicitly, um, I could use a function from the library that shows that equality respects adding a successor. So remember, we had same eq nat, uh, yeah, we had, what did I call it? Um, we had we had successor eq earlier, so I could I could have used something like successor eq, but um, okay. but I didn't. I just did the whole thing. So um, that's where you'd use these equality proofs in practice. You'd 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 you'd, you'd use an equality proof to show that um, the values that you have um, have some property, and then if you need to use that property later on, we'll basically calculate that proof. So so I find in practice these these equality proofs are not things that, um, uh, I'll come into in a moment here, <laughs> uh, that they're not things that uh, you would necessarily um, uh, have as top level proofs in your program, but they maybe are things where you're, you're testing something uh, at runtime, and then you're going to do, make lots of choices based on the result of that test. So things you calculate rather than things you do in programs. <coughs> anyway, there was a question. Uh, yeah, so there is, um, I mean, I've done this by hand, but there is a built-in one in the library because, again, I'm not expecting you to do this um, uh, all the time yourself. So I can't actually remember off the top of my head if the built-in test for uh, the, uh, equality on natural numbers is optimized, but it certainly should be if it's not. Um, yeah, another question. So the implicit argument is different in each case. So in this case, so in one, in one case it's k, and in the other case it's successor of k. So in general, what's the type of that code? Yeah, I mean, does it always, or does it mean it has the implicit argument already? So um, the type of REFL is, given an x, give me a proof that x equals x. So I can, I can turn on, I can get it to show all the implicit arguments, and then you see, you see in full what the type is of all the implicit. So given some type A uh, and given some value x, um, we build a proof that x equals x in the type A. So, um, so x, x is a legitimate argument to this. The machine needs to know what x is, but it will be something that's, that's calculated by unification. Question. Yeah. In Sorry, when you, when you just, when you just check on the equality proof. Yeah. Um, how, does, how, does the, how does the type checker take that? Now, how does the, because one thing about, one 
something that's taking off of either of the street um, a type of is it sorry, would you determine I guess that's in the question but <laughs> so how does type checking of case work? No, is that a summary or is that a bit not no, quite what you're asking? Right. Um, so it, how does it use this raffle, I mean, in particular? Yeah. So um, let's, let's just stick this hole back in um, and check the type of foo. So, if it, it's, so, uh, so pattern matching, uh, using a, a case as an intermediate expression, is, there's nothing really special going on here. It's, um, it's, it's looking at the, 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 the possible values of this intermediate expression. So, if I were to write this as a top-level function, like I could write this as a top-level function where the input is of type um, k equals j, um, uh, or sorry, maybe k equals j. And the patterns I would match would be of the form nothing and just x. So the thing that's happening is that this x, this, this, this expression here, is of type k equals j. Um, and again, if I were to do some pattern matching on that, uh, the machine would learn more about what the possible values for k and j are. So the fact that it's looking at it and seeing that it's raffle means that it's learning that k and j must be the same thing because that's the only thing that raffle could possibly construct. It could only possibly construct a proof of k equals j if it's actually a proof of k equals k. So it's going to unify j and k by, by doing that pattern match. So is that, uh, is that what you're asking? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, now, I, I am conscious that time is marching on. And there's lots of interesting things I could do. Um, so the question is, which of the many interesting things should I do? Should I make this function better so that, I mean, I could write a terrible version of check eat nat, which nobody's pointed this out yet, but I'm just going to delete that. And I'm going to write a completely legitimate version of check eat nat. <laughs> um, so I'd rather not. I'd rather not use that implementation of check eat but I, it's 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 legitimate according to the type. So I could refine this so that that is impossible, and it would it will it will produce a proof of equality if they're equal, or it can produce a proof of inequality if they're not equal. So the question is, would you like me to do that, or would you like me to move on to other kinds of predicates like uh, predicates on lists, showing that things are members of lists? Any any anyone want to shout or? Hmm? Refine, the type. Refine the type. OK. Because um, I mean, I can move on to this other stuff tomorrow, but then it means we'll not do other things later. So let's, uh, let's, let's make this type a bit better then. Let's, um, let's, let's, let's change it so that rather than producing nothing all the time, we guarantee that it's really doing the right thing, really is uh, deciding equality. So the key is to, um, I'll have to get rid of this. Uh, the key is to uh, not use maybe, but use a, a, another type called uh, DEC, short for decide. And um, what DEC will do is, so maybe has nothing and just, where just is um, um, a value of, of the appropriate type. DEC is kind of similar, except the nothing case has a little bit more going on. So I'll do, if I hit Control-Alt-D here, uh, we'll, we'll see the documentation for, um, for DEC. So we'll, we'll see how it works. So there are two possible constructors of DEC. One is yes, and then some proof of that thing that we want to, uh, to prove. And the other one is no. So this is the one that's like nothing. But unlike nothing, we have a, an argument which says, you have to provide me a proof that this is not true. So you have to show that if you, not, not only that this is something we, we don't have and we're not going to build, but that actually building it is even impossible. So by, doing, by using DEC rather than maybe, the only way we're going to be able to write check eknat is if it really is an equality function. Um, so just to, to say no, it's not going to work in general because it might be true. So let's try, uh, let's try writing that. Um, so how are we going to do it? Just as before, I'll do pattern matching on everything. And... Uh, I don't know why it pauses in this case. Did I just do that wrong? Yikes. Oh, I can't done it, okay. <laughs> right, so we've got all the, all the cases as before. I'll do the easy cases where it's true. So the easy cases are gonna be exactly the same as we had with just, because yes is basically just. 
Okay, is that reasonable? So this is, um, this is true. Right, in fact, um, because we've given it a pr precise type, I think I can do proof search here and get the answer I'm expecting. Yeah, I can. Um, so this is a bit trickier. The answer is no, but um, I have to show that zero equals successor is void. Uh, this case is also no, and again, I have to show that uh, successor equals zero is void. So I'll just, I'll just leave holes for the hard bits, basically. That's, uh, that's the way I like to work. When things get ho hard, leave a hole, come back to it later. Um, and then this uh, final case, um, uh, we'll, just as before, we'll do check eat not kj, we'll do a case split on, on the value, and um, so we had, we had just and then some proof before, now we have yes and some pr proof, um, so this is going to be, uh, this is going to be yes, and then this is going to be no. So we've got all of the yes cases work fine, the no cases we're going to have to think about. Um, I can, I can re reinstate try zip with, um, uh, I, I have the impression people are typing that in, so I'll, I'll give, while you're typing that in, I'll reinstate try zip. Um, uh, so case check eat that n m of, and then now we, we have a proof that n and m are equal here. And so we can zip x's and y's. I need to use just. Um, by the way, ex exercise for yourselves. Work out why I still can't write deck here. And I still have to write maybe here. Um, and in this case, it's, uh, it's, it's nothing. Um, OK, so that's, uh, that's try zip using check eat nat. But I, I, haven't, I haven't done the no cases, but I can still, um, uh, it, in, in the case where things are OK, it's, it's um, oh, hang on, I need to. I do need to save and reload. Um, this is where you can see that this is research quality software because I have to, I, these, these little bits of polish aren't quite done. Um, so, okay, so, so in the case where I've got a valid input, um, it, it, it succeeds. I, I can, I, it'll, it'll, because it's going through the path with yes. If I've got an invalid input, then, um, oh, it actually does come out with nothing. It just doesn't care that, it doesn't actually use these proofs, so it doesn't care. Uh, we still have to do the proofs. To, to really show that this is doing the right thing. Uh, so let's actually do these proofs. Um, so this is showing that uh, zero is not equal to a successor. So this is kind of similar to what we had before with our, you know, we were trying to show that uh, four doesn't equal five. Um, this function is gonna be remarkably similar. So show, to show that zero is not a successor, I'll, I'll use control alt L to lift it out. Um, there was a question yesterday, by the way, someone asked, um, how does, when I hit Control alt l to lift out the function, how does it decide which variables to put there? Now, it can't read your mind about what you want to do with the function. So what it does is it puts basically every variable that it's in scope, uh, that is in scope, into the type. But if it thinks it can be, uh, 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 if it thinks the argument can be implicit, then it makes it implicit. So here, k is in scope, but it's looked at it and said, well, k could easily be an implicit argument, so we'll leave it implicit. So how to write zero not suck um, by pattern matching? It's not possible. Uh, how to write suck not zero? Uh, again, lift it out, add a definition, pattern match it, it's impossible. Uh, and the final case is the slightly more tricky one. Um, I don't know what to call this, successor fail, how about that? Um, uh, so this is a little bit trickier. So I've got a, I've got a proof that k doesn't equal j, uh, and I've got a proof that successor of k does equal successor of j. So these two things contradict each other. So somehow we need to use the fact that these two things contradict each other to produce an element of the empty type. Remember that's what the, element, that's what the, em the empty type is for, is to say that something has gone wrong here. Something here doesn't make sense. I can prove that it doesn't make sense. By using these things, I can make an element of the empty type. So, um, to, um, this is getting very sluggish. I don't know why it's getting very sluggish. It's probably because there's a memory leak and it's, uh, and it's starting to struggle. Um, I know what I'll do. Actually, no, I won't do that because it's too close to the end of the lecture and it'll, it might go wrong. So, um, if, I, uh, if I look at the types now, so we'll see that, um, 
we'll see that we've got um, some proof that successor of k equals successor of j. We've got this proof that k equals j implies void. So somehow I want to get out of this a proof that uh, k equals j. I, I want to be able to, um, uh, to, so to get, my, to get my result of type void, I need to get myself a proof that k equals j. Uh, and if I can get myself a proof that k equals j, I know that something has gone wrong. I can get myself a proof that k equals j by matching on this proof that successor of k equals successor of j, because that can only be true if the two things are equal. And at that point, the type checker knows enough to know that, uh, uh, that k and j must be equal. So I'll pattern match on this proof. And now if we have a look at the, so whenever you do any step, just look at the whole, see what's changed. Um, it would be quite nice if it appeared automatically that it had changed. So now, now we have to show that given some proof that j equals j, um, we can get an element of the empty type. We're trying to get an element of the empty type. What's the proof that j equals j? Refl, Refl altogether now, yes. So, um, so we'll feed Refl to Contra and, and we're done. That was, uh, that was kind of mechanical, wasn't it? That was, you know, all, all of the things I did at each step there were kind of <coughs> almost obvious. They were fo following a process. I mean, I don't like to use the word obvious, but we're kind of following a defined process. So I see the question, I'll come to you in a moment. Um, so um, the, the, the fact that we have a process means it would be lovely to do that process automatically. So um, enter Dr. Christensen, who I believe has implemented a decidable equality um, uh, gadget. Um, so th this sort of thing can be automated um, if you want, but it's really good to know how it works. If, if you have anything that's automatic, knowing how it works is still really helpful. So there are two questions, so one at the back and then one here. Well, it's not really about uh, Vec being a proposition. It's more that um, if these, so what we'd have to do with DEC is we'd not only have to show that, um, like with, with, with maybe we can say that I don't know how to do this. Um, and DEC is not saying I don't know how to do this, but it's saying this is not possible. And it kind of is possible to produce these vectors. There are other ways that we might be able to do it. They might not be particularly meaningful ways of doing it, but we could maybe do it. So if the length of m happens to be bigger than the length of m, n, it would actually be OK to do this, uh, to, to, to zip, because we'd, we'd pull out the, the first fragment of the vector. So it's being able to prove that this thing can't be done is a lot harder than proving that the things can't be equal. So, so it's more about that than, than, than what the, the type of vector itself is. So... Um, Prop, when, so when you talk about prop, so people who are familiar with COC will know about the separation between uh, sets and props, where sets are computational things and props are things that you reason about. Idris doesn't have that distinction. And the reason Idris doesn't have that distinction is not a, a pragmatic one, that sometimes you actually want to do computation with these uh, proofs that you're constructing. Um, you don't want to do computation with the whole of the proof you're constructing, but you, you might want to look at it and see that it exists. So I don't want to rule out uh, the possibility of looking at some proof uh, when we come to running the program. So when you're looking at um, a proof that something is the element of a list, for example, that's something that you might expect to put in prop in cock. But I have programs where I really need to use that proof that something is the element of a list. Um, essentially what you get is an index, a number. So it compiles down to a, a number. Um, but that, that's what you're using it for. So I, I don't want to have that distinction. So everything is in type here. Um, and you had a question too. Yeah. Could you, could you uh, maybe I'll test it offline because <laughs> you know this is one of those I don't quite know what's going to happen and it might be confusing. Good question though. I, I, it's probably worth doing worth, uh, if, or worth trying that. Uh, right. So I would I would like to. I'm not going to get so because this is all about totality. I was going to show you techniques for talking about uh, making total programs. I think I'm going to do that on um, on Monday instead now because uh, I'd really like to do that in in some depth and. Uh, what I'll do now is just show you other kinds of proofs that turn out to be useful in practice. So, so um, equality proofs are really handy for, for this kind of showing that the users have provided some reasonable input. But in practice, you sometimes also want to uh, know that 
some data structure has some particular form, or some value has uh, appears in some data structure. So I only only got about five minutes left, or so. So I'll, I'll show you briefly how we might do this, and maybe we'll go into a bit more depth on it on on Monday. So uh, let's say that we want to show that some value is an element of some data type. So there are two ways in which uh, a value can be in a list. Uh, it can either be the first thing in the list, or it can be somewhere else in the list, right? That's that's because there are two constructors for lists. Uh, so so or there, sorry, there's 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 nil and cons, and the the, the value is not going to be in the list if if the list is nil because there's nothing in the list nil and there are two arguments to cons which are the two places where that value could possibly be if it is in the list so we'll write down a data type that expresses that kind of possibility that that kind of uh, fact that there are two places the list could be in the list so here says yes the element x is in the list and it's right here it's right at the beginning so this is a proof that x is an element of x cons x's <coughs> And then there says, well, it's in the list, but it's over there. So given some proof that x is in the list y's, x must also be in the list y cons y's, because it's just the list is just a bit bigger. OK? So um, just, to, um, just to demonstrate this idea, I've, I've, I've picked a, a modern beat combo. And we're going we're gonna to see if we can, we can talk about who's in it. Um, so. Is George in the Beatles? Well, um, yes, George is right here. So how do we prove that George is in the Beatles? Well, let's just check the type, LM George. So it's, it's, it's evaluated Beatles, just like it evaluated 2 plus 2 earlier. So John, Paul, George. So is George here? No, he isn't, because George is not John. So must be there. Let's check the type of George in Beatles now. OK, is George Paul? No, he isn't. Um, Is George George? Yes, he is. So there you go. Uh, we, have, we have verified that George is in the Beatles. So uh, what we could have done instead was uh, just say to the machine, you tell me whether George is in the Beatles, because there's only one way of constructing this. So um, did that all, uh, was that making sense? That, that, that LM is, is like. Just what I was saying before, actually, that the LM is kind of like an index into a list. So George is, George is the, the third thing in the list. So it, it's just explaining how I find him. Uh, yes, Andy. So in LM, X is Y times Y. Uh, where, how does the Y get found inside LM? So this is, again, an, implicit, uh, an implicitly bound thing. So it's, it's like writing Y is a list A so I implicitly. So what about They, they begin with a lowercase letter. They're implicitly bound. So it's, it's kind of like if I've written this and just say to the machine, you figure out what the types are. So um, I, I don't like typing if I can avoid it. Therefore, <laughs> therefore I, oh, I, I, don't like, I don't like having to, having to explain things to the machine that the machine could figure out for itself. That's kind of the, the whole premise of type-driven development is that, that computers are useful machines that can do work. So let's make them do some work. Let's not, let, let, let's not explain things. Let's not patronize it. You know, let's, let's not explain to the machine something that it can figure out for itself. Um, OK, so just as interesting is, is, is proving that uh, Peter is not in the Beatles. Um, so, so not, um, you haven't seen this yet, but not is just a function. And, well, I'll, I'll show what it expands to. Um, so if we check the type of this now, uh, so Pete, John, Paul, George, Ringo implies void. So, so this, is, this says that if, if Pete is in the Beatles, then we have an element of the empty type. Yeah? Because that would be ridiculous for Pete to be in the Beatles. Um, so it happens to be a function. So, so uh, I should give an argument here. It, the, the, when, I, when I added the skeleton definition, it didn't give the argument because by default it doesn't expand them if you didn't write them explicitly. But there, so, it, so if I, if I uh, check the type of Pete not in Beatles now, we'll see, OK, we have, we have a proof that Pete is in the Beatles. And given that, we have to make an element of the empty type. So how might we go about this? Well, let's, um, let's try case splitting on that proof. And well, it can't be here, 
So the proof can't be here because um, Pete is not the same as John. So it's only given us one possibility. It says it might be that Pete is later in the list. So let's look at the type again. Always look at the type of the whole. So now X is a proof that Pete is in the list Paul, George, Ringo. And again, if I case split on X, could it be here? No, it couldn't because Pete isn't Paul. Just keep going. Is Pete in George Ringo? Again, is Pete George? No, he isn't. Is Pete Ringo? No, he isn't. So eventually we get to the end and says, I so is Pete in the empty list? Well, looking at the type of LM, do you see any way that we can build a proof that something is in the empty list? It can only, something can only ever be in a list that's formed by X cons X's. So if I pattern match on X, both, both possibilities can't be done. So it said, every, every possible way of constructing this makes no sense. Therefore, um, oh, I'm in the wrong file. Um, therefore, that's not possible. And let's just check whether that's total. Yes, it is. So I erased the second, the second case there, Pete not in the Beatles, and it still told me it was total. Yeah, so, it, it, um, so this is just about how uh, impossible cases work. So, so um, if you give any case at all, uh, so if I just give the one case here, um, then it will generate the other possible cases that kind of correspond to that. So the fact that I've got a here means that it will also try there, see that it's impossible, and then give up. So remember with zip, we only gave the cases for nil and nil, cons and cons. Well, the type checker, just like here, it's generating nil and cons, cons and nil, seeing that they're impossible and throwing them away. So it's doing exactly the same thing. I have to give one case, because even though everything is impossible, it would be nice if we could just say, uh, you know, something like this. Um, but I, I have to give one case, just so that no, it's got some kind of hint about where to start. So um, um, equally, it might even be nice to just do. Could you put an underscore instead of there, instead of here? Uh, well, I couldn't put an underscore because, um, where were we? Uh, so so that, that would be like equivalent to putting an underscore here. And because we haven't done any kind of case analysis on X yet, we have to say to the machine, we have to explicitly say, do that case analysis. And um, uh, then it will, you know. Actually, I'm, I'm curious now. This, this might actually work. It might, it might be clever enough to know that. Uh, I should stop here, because I'm now just experimenting for my, for my own uh, entertainment. Oh, it's actually okay with that, yeah. So it, 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 you could actually put an underscore. Uh, this, this is an extension I did to the totality checker quite recently. So, so it's nice that that works. But the, the case split just gives you the two possibilities. Now then, it's, uh, it's definitely time to stop. I have, I have loads more I want to talk about with this. And I think, um, I think you probably know enough now. Having seen check eat nat, I think you might know enough on your own to figure out is LM. So lots of people nodding. So So... When, when it comes to the hands-on session, have a crack at some of the things that you didn't get through with yesterday's session. Uh, see if you can do islm on your own. And then when we come back on, uh, on Monday, uh, we'll move on to, uh, we've, I've talked about total programs, total, uh, uh, but we ha I haven't talked about how programs might terminate, how programs might, uh, might work uh, with, with, with some external systems, how, how, how servers might be responsive, and how that might uh, work as total programs. So I'd like to spend all of Monday's lecture doing that. So um, yeah, time to stop. Thank you very much. Oh, um, 